Hello and welcome to Tintin Cast episode 10 already. 10! Yes, it's a, and this week it is the fin du monde. It's the end of the world! Otherwise known as the shooting star. Yeah. So, exciting times. Uh, Hergé does sci-fi. Yes. <laughs> what do you think this week, Miles? Uh, th- again, this is one like the Black Island where I remember it very well. Um, possibly because the, it, there's not huge amounts of detail in it in terms of plot. It's basically, it's the one where Tintin goes after a meteorite. <laughs> so, so like Black Island, you remember it being the one where Tintin goes to Scotland um, and there isn't a huge amount of plot, and you know. And even though Shooting Star, I think, is regarded as it, it's not one of the major like brilliant Tintin books everyone talks about, but I think it's well regarded. And which version have you been reading? Which edition this week? I've got, well, most of mine actually are from the early 90s. So I've got the Magna edition uh, from 90, 90, no, 87, there you go. Okay. 1986, so I guess actually, in the, I think it was maybe the late 80s when I got collecting properly. And did you know that this was the first of the Tintin adventures to actually be conceived as the 62 page format uh, with the four lines per page? After reading that fact online, I did know that fact. <laughs> <laughs> After reading it earlier today. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> well, shall I fill us in on some of the background to this yes. particular uh, adventure? Yeah. Yes. So it's 1941. And daily life in occupied Germany, Germany, daily life in occupied Belgium is is pretty hard. Um, There's a lack of food and resources, as we've seen, there's a a lack of paper for Hergé's books in particular. Um, Hergé manages to find a way around some of the shortages, particularly the food shortages. He seems to use his contacts at the Portuguese newspaper that published the Tintin comic strips. And he asks the staff there to send him and his wife Jermaine food parcels and also to send food parcels to his younger brother Paul who by this time is a a prisoner of war in Germany. Um, So Hergé is continuing to work hard at home with his wife Jermaine often for 12 hours or more a day. He only occasionally travels into the centre of uh, Brussels to the offices of Le Soir and Le Soir is now this pirate edition, it's called, of, of the, the Le Soir newspaper having been taken over by the Nazis. Um, now, around this time, it seems that Hergé is also branching out into, into theatre. He, he writes a, a Tintin play with Jacques van Melkebeck entitled uh, Tintin in the Indies for the Theatre des Galeries. Uh, and that opens in April 1941, apparently to great success, although the, I think the scripts have been lost. Um, Tintin was played by a woman uh, named Jean Rubin, and uh, Hergé seems to have enjoyed this so much that he goes on to, to make another play in, in December 1941 uh, called The Disappearance of Mr Bullock, which is also uh, a Tintin adventure, uh, this time starring Roland Navet as, the, as Tintin. Um, now, around the same time, Hergé also signs to an agent, Bernard Thierry, uh, and he takes over Hergé's business matters, which starts to free up Hergé's time a bit more for writing the cartoons. So, uh, the shooting star, uh, or known as the mysterious star in the original French, uh, started to be published in Le Soir uh, in October 1941. And that continues through to May 1942. And it was published in colour book format by Casterman in 1942. And um, this new 62 page format that will now be the same for the rest of the adventures moving forward. uh, Hergé seems to quite like that kind of rigid structure now. He says, uh, I'm more at my ease in a precise format. So does it suit the book, Miles? Absolutely, I think. Uh, this is one I enjoyed very much a reread of. Um, 
Yeah, I think when we discussed it last week briefly, uh, we said we both found it a little bit terrifying when we were kids because, you know, you, the, there's, a, there's a meteor headed for Earth and that's right from the beginning, there's a sense that it's, it's hot, the Earth has got very hot and everyone's noticing it and there's a big star in the sky and it's coming closer and closer and closer and Tintin immediately goes to the observatory to check it out and um, meet this crazy professor there, oh eccentric, eccentric professor, um, two eccentric professors actually and um, there's a general sense of it's quite apocalyptic, it's almost like a if you were to take it even further, it's almost like a, a apocalypse or a zombie film or something like Night of the Comet, where it's like something weird is, or Day of the Triffids, something weird is happening, something's coming to earth. Um, and that was always a bit scary when I was a kid, because I remember being terrified of nuclear war when I was a kid. Uh, and I remember, you know, in, in 1986, wasn't it, 1986, Chernobyl happened. And we were 12, and I remember being 12 years old and seeing Chernobyl all over the news and being terrified. And when the wind blows came out that year as well, I think. And um, I just, I, I thought, less so these days, although, you know, the world's a scary place. I thought the world was gonna get blown up uh, quite a lot of the time. And we had um, Thatcher and Gorbachev and Reagan in power. And I was like, well, they're going to blow the planet up. <laughs> that was kind of the vibe, wasn't it, at the time? Absolutely. So for me, obviously, in context, this came out during World War II when everyone thought the world was going to blow up because the Nazis were trying their best. Um, but yeah, in the context of me reading it in the 80s as a kid and, and you and things like Threads coming out, we were aware, all too aware of cataclysmic disasters. <laughs> And obviously yeah. Hergé has the background of his home country having been invaded by the Nazis as well. So it's the very much this sort of end of days vibe. And um, mm. Hergé doesn't seem to do um, much in the way of um, symbolism in his books, but this does sort of feel a bit symbolic of the times for him. It does. It, it's one of those, the whole world's on fire type stories. Mm. Isn't it? And I think um, you can't ignore the context of the fact that yeah, it's escapist. Um, in a way, it's escapist. I mean, it's like making zombie films during a pandemic, which I know all about. Um, it's escapist in that, well, this is pretend and that's real. But he was obviously escaping some horrendous. I think by the end of 1941, he was more aware of what was happening with um, with the Jews and you know the way they were being treated by the Nazis and uh, the star of David being introduced and, um, you know, the ghettos being liquidized, that kind of stuff. And he was aware of it. He was more aware of it by the time this book was published. So uh, yeah, scary times, very scary times. Although the, the book does seem to, may not have been directly um, inspired by, but maybe influenced by Jules Verne. Um, there's yeah. uh, this book, The Chase of the Golden Meteor, which was published in 1908, um, mm -hmm. which seems similar in that it features this expedition to the North Atlantic to find this this meteor fragment that's fallen fallen into the ocean. Yeah, I didn't know that was the story, but yeah, it was very Jules Verne, isn't it? Uh, if you've read, you know, Around the World in 80 Days, 20,000 Leagues Under the City, there's always this sense of we're going on a scientific discovery via plane, boat, train, which is very Tintin. Um, and Tintin's vowed from the beginning of the story to go and check check this out. Like he, I love the 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 uh, recurring joke where he keeps barging his way into the observatory, <laughs> and the guy the guy is getting sicker and sicker of this guy of this young man just bursting his way into the observatory. He goes, "The observatory's on fire," and tricks his way in, and then he does it two more times. He gets in by just pushing the door open. It's like Tintin, you're very very pushy in this story, um, <laughs> but it's it is funny. And then when he when he realizes the world isn't going to end um, because the meteor. Uh, flew past the earth 48,000 miles out of is it kilometers out away from the earth he goes and kisses the guy in the observatory <laughs> instead of punching him out the way so this guy is just constantly baffled by who this young reporter is there's a uh, Edgar weighing in this on, this on cue as usual yes usual. um yeah we have this sort of professor fossil and then this this person who seems to have worked with him previously uh mm. Philippus um yes. And they seem to be sort of 
different sides of the the, the same coin in that the fossil is um kind of almost nihilistic in his his adherence to science because when the uh when the meteorite misses earth he, um when it doesn't blow the whole thing to smithereens he's a bit disappointed because he kind of quite wanted to see what would happen <laughs> and, yeah. and then philippus who used to work with him becomes this sort of prophet of doom like with a tablecloth over him going and banging gongs around the street saying the end is nigh <laughs> yeah yeah it's a good it's a good mix of crazy old men isn't it you've got the obsessed mathematic math, mathematics obsessed scientist you've got the genius you've got the mad the world's going to end guy it's kind of it's kind of anti science isn't he he's anti science he's like the world yes the, the you know in, and at one point Tintin tricks him down from uh, from the boat mast by saying this is your guardian angel please come down and the guy's like oh sorry yeah <laughs> he says i think in my version he, tintin says that he's god which i sort of um <laughs> i wondered quite what to read into that oh that's an early earlier version i think yeah i read about that and apparently yeah tintin says i'm god which is <laughs> obviously quite yeah, a bold. he turns up with this megaphone and says hello hello here's god the father but it, there's definitely some calculus professor calculus in yes in the professor isn't there because um he's oh oh dear my friend he's well-meaning he's scatty he's a genius he's ditzy um he's dizzyingly intelligent bit of an albert einstein but he's also his own worst enemy because he gets into all kinds of scrapes and is also incredibly socially awkward a uh, terrible traveller. They're all being sick on the boat. Yeah, I think Hergé, Hergé loved that scene, apparently, the, the, the mall yeah. and the uh, having dinner and all turning greener and greener. It's great. And I, 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 as someone who's been in a Force 9 gale on a ferry, um, I was coming back from Sweden in 1983. So I was about nine. And um, we got caught in this Force 9 gale. And it was just like that. It's the boat was going yeah. like that and up and down that and I did what Tintin did which is to get out of the cabin and me and my mum it was me and my mum my big sister and my dad they stayed in the cabin and they were just being sick the whole time me and my mum went up on on not on deck but we went up on the um you know to the restaurant level and just made sure we had a bit of breakfast and sort of but it was really really pitching um, so it reminded me of that, and I, you know, it, me and my mum would have been Tintin and Haddock there having a hearty meal. <laughs> That's definitely the way to do it. I used to do the boat yeah. to and from Orkney and Shetland in, in the North Sea in, in kind of a force, whatever gales, and um, yeah, getting out on deck. And that's a great scene as well, where Tintin's uh, out with uh, yeah. Captain Haddock. Captain, Captain Haddock just looks like it's just a nice sunny afternoon there on the, oh, on the wheel. Stupid. It's a nice little breeze, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, and I, and poor Snowy in this in this story, Snowy really goes through it. I mean, I you know, as an owner of a small terrier, uh, the thought of having Edgar, my dog, up on deck in a gale and or you know hanging from the wing of a plane. Um, swimming, You're always very uh, sensitive to the plights of Snowy. I know. <laughs> I'm always sensitive to yeah. Well, I'm always sensitive to animal welfare in in films, but especially you know since I've had a dog. You, you can't help but think, oh my God, if if I looked out the wing of, you know, the, the cockpit of a plane I was flying and saw Edgar hanging off the wing, <laughs> I would be like, land immediately. <laughs> but Tintin's like, we don't have time. I'll uh, I'll get out and <laughs> get out and get him. So so the whole expedition seems to be very much um, Hergé uh, crowbarring Captain Haddock back in there after the success of the Crab with the Golden Claws. Yeah, because he's not in there for the first, what, 20 pages or so. Um, and uh, suddenly, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, we're on a boat. It's got to have captured. And it works very well because it, it it definitely adds a, you want more more Haddock in there. And I love the fact that as Haddock, as they're loading up the boat and they're giving Haddock this, you know, send off, uh, you know, well done, Captain Haddock. You're a brave and noble man and you're standing up for the Society of Sober Sailors. Brilliant. <laughs> Some guy goes, where do you want all the whiskey, Captain? <laughs> and all the whiskey's coming in. <laughs> and that's a running joke throughout is, is, is Haddock is very the worst sober person ever because he just keeps going, I'll just have a thimbleful. <laughs> and then later on, I'll just try some more whiskey. More whiskey. And at the end, there's a joke about how the, the biggest distress for Haddock in this whole thing is that he hasn't had any whiskey. Um, yeah, and I love that Tintin uses that. He realizes that it's like Scooby Snacks. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah he kind of loads him up with whiskey doesn't he because he's he's uh being a bit faint of heart towards the end of the adventure so uh. yeah which actually because you know in the movie the this the spielberg jackson movie uh there's there's a sort of because i think the script is very good um it's by um edgar wright um mm. and joe cornish and stephen moffat of doctor who fame so it's very well written there's one bit where haddock he starts off as this drunken sot and then when he sobers up he lectures tintin on how you have to push through and and Haddock is actually that kind of character. He's incredibly bipolar, is Haddock. He's either going hell for leather to get anything he wants and just shouting and shouting, or he's just going, oh, I'm so pathetic, I'm so terrible. I mean, it's, you know, that the alcohol in terms of um, him. He's a bit more on the front foot here as well, I think, as well. And he meets this great yeah. character, his friend Chester, as well. Yes, I like Chester. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, it's good that he has some mates in this, and he has he has friends around the world. Haddock, he's sort of renowned. Yeah. So he has, you yeah, the guy who yeah, it's Chester the lad who um captains the Sirius. Yeah, and they do this kind of crazy kind of ritual really dance cool. together when they meet. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they go fidgy, fidgy, fidgy. Yeah. <laughs> go like the Eagles. <laughs> go Eagles. Oh, it reminded me of um. Indiana Jones, when they, uh, Indy's dad and Denham Elliott meet up uh, after years of not seeing each, and they do this old bo old school Thai little thing, you know. Um, that was great. I like the fact that that they've got, that there's a lot of travel in this, but it's fairly simply, it's fairly based around they're trying to get the boat to the meteor that's crashed in the ocean. So it's not a complicated voyage, but there's people trying to stop them. So he goes in and goes, oh, can I? And, and I love the fact that Haddock's obsessed with the oil. He just wants the oil. And then he's like, OK. And then his friend goes, Chester goes, well, we may be able to think of a plan, uh, Captain. He goes, what, to get the oil? <laughs> he <just wants laughs> the oil. He's obsessed. He wants the oil. And then he wants the whiskey. <laughs> the whole um, race for the meteorite here. Um, and, and this is where it's the first place where Herjo runs himself into a little bit of trouble because um, mm. he shows the, the the baddies who are racing against Tintin and co uh, yeah. to be sort of American big business in the original books I think there was an American flag yeah. on, on the top of the rival uh, yeah. the boat obviously Herjo's already shown his distaste for American big business in in uh, Tintin in America yeah and um, I think this was very much his mentor uh, Abel Valez his philosophy coming through that the, this rivalry would develop between Europe and, and North America. Mm. And, uh, but I think Americans were very put out to be portrayed as the, the, the villains in this. Um, and in fact, in 1954, when Hergé rewrote some of this, he changed the flag and the nationality on, on that boat from the US to um, this uh, fictional, fictitious South American country, Sao Rico. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but because like America were about, were about to sort of enter the war and, and come to the, to the rescue of Europe as well. And, and apparently, um, Hergé's younger brother, Paul, was in a prisoner of war camp in, in Germany at the time. And they were sort of being able to, they were getting this in the post to read Tintin every week. And apparently he was absolutely furious the way that Hergé had betrayed the Americans. Yeah, and he didn't, and he didn't want to be seen as anti-American or anti-Semitic, which is another issue with the book. It yes. does pop up. I mean, I, you know, I studied um, A-level history and we, we did um, modern history. So we did 1933 to about 1965, I think we did in the first, the first year. We studied Hitler's rise to power and the dehumanization of Jewish people and all that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the criticism against this book, the way the bad guy is portrayed as the stereotypical Jew, it's insulting and it's offensive. It just is. I mean, you look at it, it's, and also was of the time. So at the time, Tintin was, uh, Hergé was, was quoted as saying this was, this was the style, this was the fashion, uh, you know, and also obviously he was working for, uh, at that point, a Nazi run newspaper and it did have anti-Jewish propaganda in it. And then suddenly you had this character who was this stereotypical Jew, the, you know, which in the book is the sort of, there's a certain shape to the face and that's how they were portrayed in Nazi propaganda um, and being greedy and so forth and running, running, you know, you know, yeah. the world. 
Apparently, um, Herjo was warned while he was writing the book because he called the ruthless financier here uh, Blumenstein. And someone said, yeah. oh, you do, you do realise, Herjo, that's, that's a Jewish name. Maybe that's not particularly appropriate to, to, to put in the book. Yeah. So he changes it to, and I don't know how innocent this is, this is or Herjo changes it to, to Boilwinkle. Um, and and he um, he thought of that name as as being like the name for a little candy shop in Brussels dialect apparently, um, mm. but Bullwinkle also transpired to be a, a Jewish name. So he thought he was putting things right, and actually he just you know ended up making as much trouble for himself as uh, so. Um, but apparently in in later rewritings of the book, he refused to change that because he said it had been an innocent mistake, and he didn't realize. I mean obviously the drawing wasn't an innocent mistake yeah. that is obviously a, a jewish character but but the yeah. surname he sort of said oh, no that was um that wasn't intended yeah and you can tell you you could sort of look at it and say you know um, you know this is this is offensive and stuff and obviously it was and it is and so forth but yeah i think things have changed so much in even in the last five years that there was a way people might have been portrayed five years ago that was of the time and offensive, but it was accepted by the world at large because they were a bit ignorant about it. Now you couldn't do it because we're all too aware now of what's offensive and we're all too aware of, you can't get away with it now. And it's good, you know, it's good that you can't um, do certain cliches and like, you know, the whole Apu thing, you know, you're not, you shouldn't have non-Indian actors playing Indian characters. And everyone's agreed and gone, you know what, why not? Yeah, of course, because if the Indians audience watching that are offended, what's the point? There's no, why, what's the point in having a white guy doing an Indian guy's foot? Don't do it, just let an Indian actor do it. And I do agree with that. And I think it doesn't mean you need to go back and remake all of The Simpsons because it was, it, you know, we accepted it at the time, but now you can still watch it, but now you know that that's changed, so. You know, and even Hank Azaria, who did the voice, said, I understand I'm not doing that voice anymore and I shouldn't be doing that voice anymore. It's like, OK, well, great. We've all learned something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can see why Hergé said, I'm not going to change it because I didn't. I see that it was offensive, didn't mean it to be offensive. I've learned I wouldn't do it again. So, you know. And um, Hergé, it's not quite the rigor of research that the later science fiction books on the moon and uh, explorers on the moon and uh, destination moon would be mm. um and in fact there's been apparently some pushback saying that uh, well if a meteorite was approaching earth it wouldn't be very it wouldn't be hot like that and the, 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 surely the meteorite would sink it wouldn't float on the water and there was even a thing about the the, the boat not being particularly seaworthy i think that um uh, that, that goes out to visit the the, the meteor um, but aside from that, I mean, I think it's it's a really exciting and and um, I mean, I was terrified by the first third of the book with the with yeah. the massive spider and and the yeah. um, actually the massive spider at the end as well, and yeah. uh, the whole end of the world thing. Um, and then at the end, you get these exploding magic magic mushrooms. Yes, I know well, that's trippy, isn't it? I know, and then you start going, well, hang on a minute. If the mushrooms and the spider and the maggot have grown. Why hasn't it affected uh, Tintin and Snowy? You know, why aren't we, they're mm. organic as well? Why aren't they enormous suddenly? Um, oh yeah. yeah. But that's very and the trees growing and stuff. I really like that because it's it's not been seen in Tintin before. It's a little bit trippy. Uh, it's an interesting idea. It is very um, journey to the center of the earth. Actually, that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, yeah, it is very Jules Verne, isn't it? Uh, and the way that the water's creeping up and it's all it's a, it's a rather creepy like when the when the plane pilot goes off and says well, I'll be back tomorrow and Snowy's like oh my god I'm not staying here for 24 hours <laughs> you would be wouldn't you <laughs> it does yeah. it. but I like Snow Snowy gets a lot to do in this as well we mentioned Snow well he, he gets, gets to he gets to wee on a, uh, <laughs> a stick of dynamite <laughs> that's about to explode which apparently Hergé wanted to do in Cigars of the Pharaohs but they wouldn't uh -huh. let him and I don't know whether it's just because he's got so famous by now or because you know maybe sensibilities exactly. were different during the war years but uh, Snowy was allowed to urinate in, in the cartoon. Uh -huh. Oh bless him. Snowy yeah Snowy you also get to hear his thoughts because in the last book um, he was quite quiet wasn't he? Yeah he doesn't really sort of communicate with people much anymore but he still no. does has the odd line and he says you know he warns Tintin about stuff and then he does he rescues he saves Tintin's life later on by biting him on the ass 
So you know, that's, <laughs> I, I would expect Edgar to bite me on the ass if I was about to drown. Um, Bawdy stuff in the shooting star. <laughs> on the seven crystal ball scale, what will you give the shooting star? I'm going to give this one a five, I think. Five being a good, enjoyable, better than average, memorable adventure, but not, uh, not quite venturing into, even though I gave Black Island seven, I just think, I think Black Island is genius. Black Island has proved to be a lot of people's favourite, actually. Um, it's just a really fun uh, romp, shooting stars. Very, it's very funny. And it's very action packed. What do you reckon? I'm going to say uh, a five as well. Um, I thought it was a good, solid story. Yeah, you're right. Quite like uh, Black Island, the way it's structured. Uh, mm. Haddock, really good. Um, the whole really kind of quite sinister at the start, quite dark. Um, I liked all of that. And um, it was actually felt the Zoe. Tintin was in peril a few times, which is always good. It actually brings a bit of, a, of, of a danger to, to the whole thing. So, yeah, I think five. Yeah, it's a solid five, isn't it? I think once you get, I mean, I'd be surprised as we go on, not saying it won't, but I'd be surprised if anything drops below five from this point on, because I know there's some stone cold classics coming up. There's definitely a couple of sevens coming up, but there's probably quite a few sixes. Um, I think. You know, I suspect later on there might be a four, but it, but it's once it gets up to this level, five is about the lowest I can feel myself going because it would have to be quite shaky to be a four now, you know, because they're generally brilliant from this point on. And, and obviously next week is a special one. Well, next week is a double bill because we'll be covering The Secret of the Unicorn and Red Rackham's Treasure. Brilliant. And that's the first two that are done as a very specific first and second, aren't they? As in tune in next book to find out what happens, you know. Um, yeah, they're kind of inseparable. There was uh, Cigars of the Pharaohs and the Blue Lotus that are kind of one follows on from the other, but they aren't really, yeah, stitched together in the same way as uh, uh, the, the next two. But yeah, so I'm really looking forward to those. And obviously they form the basis of the Spielberg movie. So I'll probably read them both, do the research, and then watch the movie just to get uh, immersed in the in this Tintin verse. Absolutely, me too. So to take us to there next week, um, what happens next? So the shooting star finish, finishes being serialised in Le Soir on the twenty seventh of May, nineteen forty two, uh, and a week later, the Jews uh, in Belgium were ordered by the Nazis to start wearing the, the yellow stars to identify themselves. And soon um, there were Gestapo raids, uh, Jews were being taken away and killed within Belgium. So the full horror uh, of what was happening starts to become apparent to everybody, certainly to Hergé. Um, he says, uh, he said later, actually, I saw very few Jews wearing the yellow stars at first, but finally did see some. Uh, they told me some Jews were gone that people had come for them and sent them away. I didn't want to believe it. Um, and meanwhile, of course, Le Soir, the, uh, the pirate newspaper, continues writing increasingly anti-Semitic pieces, um, in some cases even suggesting that it's, it was no longer enough for Belgians to exclude Jews from certain areas of public life. That they, sh they were saying by this stage that they should consider Jewish people foreigners from an you know, opposing race even. Mm. Um, so on, on the more colourful side, literally, um, Hergé's publisher, Casterman, is uh, now starting to move the books into colour. Um, they decide that all of the old Hergé Adventures of Tintin books should be immediately redrawn, rewritten and uh, turned into colour. So Hergé sets about that task um, and that would continue the colourisation from 1942 to 1947. But obviously, while that is all happening, Hergé is continuing writing these incredible new adventures. So we'll be reading a couple of them in the next week. So uh, we'll look forward to joining you all then. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, that double bill because it is a big crescendo in Tintin reading, isn't it? You enjoy the first 10 books and you're getting really into it. And there's some classics and some classics. And then comes Secret of the Unicorn, Red Rackham's Treasure, which a lot of people would say are the first two 
or the most famous two, I guess, the first two you might think of. Um, even though we're huge fans of the whole series, I think those two are particularly special. So I should look forward to rereading them because, again, it's been years since I've read either of them. So, mm, can't wait. Good stuff. Enjoy, my friends. See you next time. Adios.